You know, several years ago, I was given a sermon by a man. I forget who actually gave me the sermon. I do remember who the sermon was by. It was by Dr. Charles Stanley, who at that time was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Atlanta, Georgia. And this guy said to me, I want to give you this sermon. He said, this is one of the greatest sermons I've ever heard in my life. I want you to listen to this sermon. And I remembered it was just on a cassette tape. Some of you remember those cassette tapes. And I put it in my car, and I listened to it. And it was, a, I thought, a pretty good sermon. I didn't think it was outstanding. I didn't think it was the best sermon I've ever heard before. Listened to it, put it aside, and went on. Well, a few years later, I saw that sermon, and I remembered what that guy said. Wow, it's such a powerful sermon. you got to listen to this sermon. It's one of the greatest sermons I've ever heard in my life. So I put it in once again, that cassette tape, listened to it a second time. The second time, it was different. The second time, it really did impact my life. And the second time, I thought, yes, this is a very, very great and powerful sermon. What happened to the sermon? How did it change? I mean, it was on a cassette tape. How was that sermon different the second time I listened to it? You know, actually, the sermon was just the same. Amen. It was a recording. You couldn't change it. What was different? I was different. I had ears to hear. I had a mind to understand. And I was able to take in what God was saying to me. You know, sometimes when you might say to me, hey, that sermon you preached really impacted me, or I really enjoyed that sermon, sometimes you're not so much saying something about me as you're saying something about you. You see, I can stand up here week after week and preach the gospel and share the gospel, but you have to have ears to hear. You have to have a mind to understand, and you have to have a will to obey. Now, today I'm going to talk about the cross of Jesus Christ. How many sermons have you heard about the cross? Some of you have been Christian, been a Christian for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, maybe longer. How many sermons have you heard about the cross? But maybe this will be the sermon that really impacts your life. Maybe this is the sermon when you have ears to hear, you have a mind to understand, you have a will to obey. And yes, just like myself, I had heard that sermon before, but when I heard it again, it impacted my life. I was in a different place. I was in a place of receptivity. I was in a place of responsiveness. Maybe that's where you are today. As you hear this message on the cross of Jesus Christ, I pray that this will be more than just another sermon, just words that you hear. More than my words, I hope you hear God's word today about the cross. And so if you have your Bible, we're still in the Gospel of Mark. We have now come to Mark chapter 15, and I want to read verses 21 through 32. It says, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha. Now, Golgotha comes from the Aramaic. Calvary comes from the Latin. Sometimes we call it Calvary. Sometimes we call it Golgotha. Both mean the place of the skull. Verse 23. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour, that is, it was about 9 a.m. when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him, remember we saw that Pilate charged him with treason, that he was claiming to be the king in rivalry to Caesar. So it says in the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. 
And with him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come, now, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe those who were crucified with him also reviled him. We've been talking a lot about the death of Jesus Christ. Even next week, you'll hear again about the death of Jesus Christ because as we're going through God, the gospel of Mark leading up to the resurrection, we have to talk about the suffering of Jesus. We have to talk about the beatings. We have to talk about his crucifixion. But let me tell you this. You can never preach too often or too much about the cross of Jesus Christ. There may be topics that a pastor may want to preach on, and you might say, hey, he's preaching on that subject too much, or we've heard too much about that topic, or too much about that subject. You might say, that's a hobby horse for that pastor. Well, I want to tell you this. You cannot preach too often or too much on the cross of Jesus Christ. It is central to the faith right there, the cross. I mean, when you see the golden arches, what do you know? It's a McDonald's. When you see a cross, what do you know? That is a Christian church. That is a place where they believe in Jesus Christ and proclaim Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so again today, I want to talk about the cross. And I want to share three things about the cross. And the first, you already know this. But I want to remind you, and I want to just bring it out before you once again, the cross was cruel. You have no idea. I have no idea how cruel it actually was. We don't know for sure who was the first person, who was the first leader who actually devised what we call crucifixion. It was not the Romans, even though they mastered the art of it, but it preceded even the Romans. But somewhere, some sadistic ruler devised the idea that when you're going to punish someone, you're going to punish them by crucifixion. Now, the Romans, even before you got to the cross, even before you were crucified, they were already beating you. They were already bringing upon you such suffering that many people even died from that suffering. They were scourged. They were flogged. And they would take that whip and they would connect to the whip bone and metal and maybe glass in order to just beat your back and beat your side and just rip the flesh, even penetrating to the bones where when someone would be crucified, you could see the bones because they had been whipped in such a merciless way. That's what flogging was. And the Romans, those who were charged with flogging a man, what their goal was, was to flog you to the point of death, but not to death. They didn't want you to die because they wanted to crucify you. And so if they flogged you and you died during the flogging, it was a, considered a failure because they wanted to beat you. They wanted you to suffer. They wanted to mock you. But then they wanted to crucify you publicly. And Jesus had been beaten. Jesus had been flogged. Jesus had been beaten so much, the Bible says here, he was unable to carry his own cross beam. So the horizontal part of the cross is what you would carry. The vertical part would be there at the place of execution already. But the Romans, again, just to make it even worse... They weren't about to carry the cross beam for you. You had to carry it. And under the weight, Jesus, because he had been beaten, because of the suffering, 
Because of the trial, think of even the trial that went through the night. I mean, he hadn't even slept. And he was unable to carry the crossbeam. They had to find a man by the name of Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross for him. Now, when they offered him the wine mixed with myrrh, he refused to drink it. Now, some believe that this was a drink in order to take away the pain. Probably not. Myrrh in wine was kind of considered fine wine, something that a person of royalty would drink. I think the soldiers were still mocking Jesus. I don't think the soldiers were offering him, him any type of drink to take away the pain. I think they were still indulging in the mockery. Oh, you're the king of the Jews. Let me give you a glass of fine wine, wine mixed with myrrh for you to drink while you're on your throne, the cross. And Jesus would not participate in that. He was not going to participate in the mockery. He was crucified publicly. We know that. They didn't crucify you in hiding. As I have said here more than once, if they were crucifying today, where would they crucify you? Either in the center of the city or maybe more probably just on the side of the interstate, right out there on I-75. That's where the crosses would be. So as people are driving by, they could see the crucifixions because Rome wanted to crucify to say to you, if you turn against Rome, this will happen to you. And he was crucified publicly, either naked or almost naked. Did you see they cast lots for his clothing? They stripped him of his clothing. And often the Romans did this. They wanted to ridicule you. They wanted to mock you. I mean, you're bleeding and you're bruised and bones are being revealed from the flogging and the scourging and, and you're naked or half naked upon the cross in a public fashion. People ridiculing you. People saying things to you to mock you. That happened. Jesus faced heartless derision and scorn from the bystanders, also from the religious leaders, even the two on the cross with him. Now, we know from Luke, one of the men that was crucified had a change of heart, but at least at the beginning, they both were mocking him, and they both were ridiculing him. He was crucified between these two. At times, they're called thieves. At times, they're called robbers. This Greek word has the idea of a revolutionary, an insurrectionist. Who knows? They might have been partners with Barabbas. And it should have been Barabbas who was crucified with these two. But instead, it's Jesus. Let me tell you, the cross was cruel. Some remained upon the cross for days. That did not happen with Jesus. But for some, they remained upon the cross for days. You say, how did they die? Well, some went into shock. Some went raving mad. Oftentimes, they would die of suffocation where they couldn't raise up enough to get a breath. Or they would die of heart failure. Eventually, they would die. And they didn't care much for the body. Oftentimes, the body was thrown aside for wild dogs or vultures to pick at and eat. Let me tell you, it would be hard to devise a manner of capital punishment worse or more cruel than crucifixion. And that's how Jesus died for you and me. Look at Psalm 22, verses 7 and 18. This is a prophecy about Jesus on the cross. It says, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults shaking their heads. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Let me tell you, God knew this was going to happen. Amen. Do you know as you read through the Bible, I love what Adrian Rogers once said. He said, listen, there aren't four gospels. There are 66 gospels in the Bible. He said, hey, the, the whole Bible is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when you read through the Old Testament and you read through Genesis and you read through Psalms and you read through the prophets, when you read through these books of the Bible, they're looking forward to the cross. 
And here in Psalm 22, go back and read Psalm 22. Go back and read an account of the crucifixion like Mark 15 and then lay beside it Psalm 22 and you will see the fulfillment of prophecy. This did not catch God by surprise. Actually, it was the plan of God. The plan of God. Before God created you and me, before God created this world, he knew the cross was inevitable. The Bible speaks of Jesus who was crucified before the foundation of the world. You can read that in the book of Revelation. I think it's chapter 13. Jesus who was crucified before the foundation of the world. You say, well, he wasn't crucified before the foundation of the world. He was in the mind of God. He was in the plan of God. The cross was not a mistake. And the cross was not even plan B. The cross was inevitable. It was the plan of God. And it's something that we boast in and celebrate. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 through 24. It says, Jews demand signs. Did they not at times say to Jesus, give me a sign? Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Notice what it says. To the Gentiles, to the Greeks, to the Romans, the cross is foolishness. How could someone die on the cross and yet be considered a religious leader, considered the son of God? But we boast in the cross, amen? Amen. We know it was the plan of God, and it was cruel. And don't ever forget this. Salvation is free in that you cannot earn it, but it is not free when it comes to God and when it comes to Christ. He paid the ultimate price for our freedom and for our salvation. And so, yes, we say salvation is free, not because it doesn't cost God anything. It cost God nothing everything. It's just free in the sense that we can't deserve it and we can't work for it. We can't earn it. So the cross was cruel. Well, the second thing about the cross I'd like to share with you today is the cross was critical. And what I mean by this, it was indispensable. I'm using that word critical in the sense that the cross was essential. The cross was in dispensable. There was no other way. We've already seen this, right? When we looked at the Garden of Gethsemane and when Jesus was praying, he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And God, his silence, the silence of God, the Father shouted, there is no other way. You have to drink the cup. The cross was critical. Look at verses 31 and 32. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. That's very important. He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Now, he could have come down from the cross... It says that he could have called the legions of angels to come and deliver him and protect him and to rescue him. But it says this, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He saved others. He forgave people of their sins. He cast demons out of people. He healed their bodies. He saved others. He cannot save himself. Those two go together. If he did save himself, he could not save others. He saved others by not saving himself. We're talking about a substitutionary atonement. They said, come down from the cross and we will believe. 
General William Booth, the, founda the founder of the Salvation Army, he said this, it is because Jesus did not come down from the cross that we believe in him. Amen. It's not come down from the cross and then we will believe in you by not coming down from the cross. That's why we believe in you. Amen. You see, the cross was critical. It says he saved others. He cannot save himself. If in that moment, in a moment of weakness, he would have saved himself, he would not be able to save you or he would not be able to save me. The reason he can save us is because he did not save himself. It's a substitutionary atonement. We talked about this a few weeks ago with Barabbas. Remember the custom during the Passover? Pilate would bring out two who were charged with crimes, and he would say, you know, which do you want? He would release a prisoner, and on that day, he had Jesus of Nazareth, and actually Barabbas' first name was Jesus, Jesus Barabbas. He had Jesus of Nazareth, and he had Jesus Barabbas, and he said, which one do you want? And they said, give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus of Nazareth, give us Barabbas. And Barabbas, who was guilty, Barabbas, who should have been on the cross, he was released scot-free. He received a presidential pardon, if you will, and Jesus went to the cross. Let me tell you, you're Barabbas. Amen. I'm Barabbas. We deserve to die. We deserve to be on the cross, but Jesus was on the cross on our behalf. Look at 1 Peter 3.18. I think it makes it so clear. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Right there, substitutionary atonement. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He only died once. He does not need to die again. The blood will never lose its power. One time is all he had to die. Atonement's been made. What we have to do is apply the benefits of the atonement. I mean, think about you as a Christian. As a Christian, as a follower of Christ, are you perfect? No. Do you ever fall short? Yes. So let's say you're a Christian you believe in Jesus Christ. You've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You've been baptized in water by immersion in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And sometime after that, you commit a grievous sin. Does Jesus have to be crucified all over again? Does he have to get back on the cross in order to pay that debt once again? No, he's already paid your sin debt in totality once. He died once for all. You simply have to reappropriate the benefits of the cross and believe he died once. He doesn't have to keep dying over and over and over again. You just reaffirm my belief, my faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Of course, you repent along with that, but you reaffirm you died for this sin. You not only died for the sins that I committed before becoming a Christian, you also died for the sins that I've committed after becoming a Christian. He died for all sins. And you reaffirm your faith in the blood of Jesus. The just for the unjust. Substitutionary atonement. That's why we boast in the cross. Galatians 6, 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Some people are boastful by nature, boastful by personality, boastful. They just boast a lot. Let me tell you, if you like to boast, I've got something you can boast in. Quit boasting in yourself. Quit boasting in your bank account. Quit boasting in your accomplishments. Quit boasting in your family heritage and begin boasting in the one thing you can boast in all you want. That's the cross. You can boast in the cross. You can celebrate the cross. And think about what Paul is saying here. Of all the things he could pick out, he said, may I never boast in this, 
the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if he left out our Lord Jesus Christ, this wouldn't make sense. Who's going to boast in crucifixion? Who's going to boast in a form of capital punishment? If I said, I will boast in nothing except the electric chair, that sounds strange, doesn't it? That sounds odd, doesn't it? And in that day, it would have sounded equally odd. If he just said, may I never boast except in crucifixion, would make no sense. It's not the cross, it's the one who was on the cross. He said, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We boast in the cross. The cross was critical. Well, one other thing I want to share with you today, the cross was life changing. It was cruel, it was critical, but it was also life changing. And I want to show you how it changed a man's life. And it changed that man's family as well. It's right here in the text that we just read. Verse 21, it says, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. This man, he is called Simon of Cyrene. Do you know the most popular name in the first century was Simon. When we look at all the records and we look at all the writings, the name Simon comes up more than any other name. You know, we have that happen. You can Google today top 10 male names in 2021 or 2022, and you'll have a list. The most popular name in that day was Simon. Even in the New Testament, we read of Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon the Zealot, Simon the Tanner, Simon the Leper, Simon the Magician, all of these Simons. And back then, they didn't have last names. So your name was connected maybe from, to the city that you were from or your occupation or something that described your life like you were a leper. And so Simon of Cyrene was one who was from Cyrene. This was an important city in North Af Africa, modern-day Libya. And so Simon of Cyrene, he was from Cyrene. He was from North Africa. There was a large Jewish colony that existed in Cyrene there in North Africa. And evidently, he had traveled for the Passover. He had traveled from North Africa, modern-day Libya, Cyrene, in order to come all the way to Jerusalem with his family to celebrate the Passover, to celebrate this very, very important Jewish feast and festival. And unbeknownst to him, he would be compelled by Roman soldiers to carry the crossbeam for Jesus of Nazareth. You see, Palestine, Israel, was occupied territory. It was under the jurisdiction and authority of Rome. And a Roman soldier had the right anytime, anywhere, anything to, consc to conscript you and employ you in their service to give you a charge, to give you a task, and you had to do it or face the consequences. And with this one, Simon of Cyrene, the Roman soldier said to him, carry his cross. And he did. And what an impact that had on his life. You know, there are many stories in the New Testament. We don't know the person's name, right? We don't know the person's name. Why do we know his name? Why does it say Simon of Cyrene? And not only that, but Mark says here, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why would he be that descriptive? Why would he give that much detail? You see, we believe Mark wrote his gospel to the church in Rome. And evidently, he knew that they knew Simon of Cyrene. They knew Alexander. They knew Rufus. That's the only reason he would give such detail. And what but what in Romans 16, 13, at the end of his letter, he says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, 
who has been a mother to me as well. Now, we can't prove this without a shadow of a doubt, but I think it's very, very likely that this Rufus that Paul says, I want you to greet Rufus there in the church at Rome, Mark's gospel, we believe, very sure, his gospel was written to Christians in Rome, and in his gospel, he speaks of this Simon of Cyrene. Hey, and you all know him. He's the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why else would you add these details? And then he says, hey, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and also greet his mother. Paul said, she's like a mother to me. You see, I believe Simon of Cyrene, he went there for the Passover. He went there just to celebrate a Jewish festival. But let me tell you, his life was forever changed. Not just by carrying the cross beam, but watching Jesus and seeing how he acted, seeing how he interacted, seeing what he did on the cross and the forgiveness he bestowed and the way that he was able to die as a sacrifice. He was going to celebrate the Passover. He witnessed the Passover at the cross. I think it changed his life. I think it changed his wife's life. I think it changed his son's life. I think it had that impact on him. And let me tell you, it can do the same for you. The cross can change your life. It changed Simon of Cyrene. It changed Rufus. I think it changed the whole family. Once Paul was asked, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. Do you know God can save a household? He can save a husband. He can save a wife. He can save the children. Of course, they all have to make a choice to believe, but the cross was life changing. This man actually carried the cross beam. You're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But let me tell you, the cross is still life-changing. And when you understand what he did for you and how he died for you and how he suffered for you, didn't have to, could have called down a whole host of angels to rescue him. But what did they say? He saved others. He cannot save himself. You know why? Because you can't have it both ways. If he saved himself, he couldn't save others. He saves you and he saves me by not saving himself and giving his life at the cross. I want to end with this question. Have you had an encounter with Jesus that has changed your life and the life of your family? I believe Simon had that encounter and listen, he wasn't going to church. He wasn't expecting this. You know, sometimes that encounter comes when you're not expecting it. I remember when the Lord began to draw me to himself and to begin to convict me. It was at a church service I just was attending, and I wasn't expecting to hear from God that day. And the preacher spoke, but also the Holy Spirit spoke. You know, there's the outward call of God that's me talking right now. That's the outward call of God. I'm preaching right now. You can actually hear my voice right now. That's the outward call of the gospel. But there's the inward call of the gospel. That's not my voice. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit. And what's beautiful is when the two coincide and you're hearing the outward call of the gospel, but you're also hearing the inward call of the gospel. The outward call cannot save, but the inward call coupled with the outward call, if received with faith, can be a life-changing experience. Have you had an encounter with Jesus that changed your life and the life of your family? If you haven't, you can have that encounter today. You can kneel before Christ and ask him to forgive you and make you whole. Would you stand with me this morning as we have a song of response? These two altars in front of me, you're welcome to come and pray privately or with your family. If you would like for a pastor to pray with you, the outer altars are open and available. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for the cross. It was a cruel experience for our Lord and Savior, but so critical and definitely life-changing. Lord, I've been changed by the cross. Many here today have been changed by the cross. And Lord, if there's someone here today that cannot say, may I never boast, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was written by a man that was captivated by the cross, clinging to the cross. Lord, may we say that. May I never boast. I'm not boasting about my money, my abilities, how I look. May we only boast in what matters and will matter throughout all eternity, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, have your way in this service, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today for Town Church Online. We pray you've been blessed, encouraged, and even challenged by today's message. If you would like to respond in any way, maybe you'd like to give your heart to Jesus. Maybe you have a prayer request you'd like to share, or you'd like to just check in and let us know how you're doing. You can go to our website at town.church slash connect and fill out our online connect card there. Also, if you'd like to give to Town Church to support the continuing ministry here in our area and beyond, go to our website at town.church slash invest and you can give of your tithes and offerings there. Make sure to like, subscribe, or to follow uh, so you can get these messages each time they come on. You can find the, the links there in the description of this video. Until we're able to see each other again, we pray you be blessed.